uh, let's read verses 1 to 4. This is God's word. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, uh, we need your word even more than we need uh, physical food because your word is life. Uh, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, Father, give us hungry hearts now to feed on your word as we listen. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, that we, we would meditate upon it, that we would think through the implications for how we live our lives, uh, that we would even be changed by your spirit, working this word into our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I you to imagine with me today that you enter into a large room where there are seats all placed in a large circle. And uh, there's already a few people seated. Uh, there's still more people filing into the room. And you make your way over to a chair and say a shy hello to the person closest to you. Uh, you actually don't know anyone in this meeting. But by the time everyone has arrived, there's probably about 30 people seated in this circle. And uh, then the leader uh, gets the meeting underway and uh, says that the first item on the agenda, we're going to introduce ourselves to one another. Uh, we're going to take in turns of going around the circle. And the leader says, I want you to tell me, uh, first of all, your name and, <laughs> and one thing about you. Uh, in fact, I want you to tell the group the one thing that you think defines your life, the one thing. And as you can imagine, you're sitting there thinking, hang on a minute, what is the one thing that defines my life? You start to experience a bit of panic. What am I going to say? But thankfully, the, um, the, you know, the, they go that way. And so you've got 30 people to, to decide this one thing that sums up my life. And as, as they go around, <clears throat> you get to hear how each person in the group defines themselves. And so you get the obvious answers. The first one says, hi, I'm Laura. I'm from New Zealand. Uh, OK, so you define yourself by where you're from. Right, got it. The next person says, hi, I'm um, Bob. Uh, I'm a builder. And uh, you go, right, career. That's how you define yourself. Got it. But then the next response gets a little bit more challenging, maybe even uncomfortable, because uh, Rex, he, he says it like this. He says, hi, I'm Rex. I'm a divorcee. OK. Uh, the next one, even more uncomfortable, uh, this lady says, hi, I'm Fran. I'm an abuse survivor. Right. OK. Uh, now, if this was an AA meeting, which it's not, but if it was, you would hear people say things like, hi, I'm an alcoholic. Uh, they would define themselves as perhaps a drug addict even. Uh, but this is a different type of meeting. But you're listening to all of these different ways. The, what, the things that people look to that they see as defining who they are. And you're wondering, well, what will I say? What is it that sums up my life? If you were in that meeting, what would you say? The one thing that you think defines your life. Uh, you see, for many, as this, this group shows, many people actually look to their achievements to define their life, so career, um, success in a certain field. I'm sure everyone would, be able, would love to be able to say, hi, I'm Jared, I'm a, a Nobel Peace Prize winner. <laughs> um, some would like to say, uh, well, maybe not so much now, but you know, a test captain of, uh, for Australia, um, or you know, Prime Minister of Australia. I think that's the, the one up from that. Uh, for others, though, people like to define their, their lives according to a physical factor about them. Um, so for some, they might say, you know, what defines my life is I'm disabled, or I'm childless, or I'm old. Uh, for some, it's a failure, 
or a mistake that they let define who they are. But what I'm saying is that everyone has something that they look to that says, that is the thing that defines my life. And it's a very important thing to think through because whatever actually defines us will then control the way we live. It will shape the way that we interact with other people. It will actually in shape who we interact with. Uh, it will shape the way that we think about the goals that we're trying to reach in life, um, the experiences we're trying to pursue, the, the things we buy, the kind of lifestyle we're trying to live. And it will definitely shape the way that we handle pressure and suffering. Whatever it is that we think defines our life will then shape the way we live. And I start with all of this because it actually takes us to the very heart of what this passage in Colossians is all about. This passage is saying that for those who have put their faith in Jesus, now for a Christian, for someone who has received Jesus as their Lord and Saviour, the thing that, is, that does define your life, whether you know it or not, but if you're a believer, what defines your life is, as verse 3 says there, your life is hidden with Christ in God. Okay, if you're a believer, that's what defines your life. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. And so I want to look at this phrase um, tonight and, and consider what does it mean? Then how do we experience that and where is it taking us? Okay, so what does it mean? What does it mean that your life is hidden with Christ in God? And in some ways, this is something that we've, we have been looking at all the way through Colossians because Colossians is all about this. Colossians teaches us that when we come to Jesus... When we put our faith in him as our Lord and as our Saviour, that we're not just followers of Jesus. We're not just trying to uh, you know, model our lives on his example. Uh, we're not just trying to follow his teaching. But when we come to faith in Christ, we are actually in Christ, is the phrase that is used over and over in Colossians. Uh, it's this idea that we are united to Christ We've been talking about it all through Colossians and now when we get to this chapter, here Paul has another way of expressing this idea that your life is hidden with Christ in God. And so you think about that. Uh, think about something that's hidden. Perhaps if you've got a, um, a safe at home and you have something that you treasure uh, a lot, something very valuable to you, and you put it in that safe and then it's hidden in that safe. And so whatever happens to the safe is what happens to that valuable item. And that's the idea here, that as a believer, your life is now hidden in Christ. Whatever happens to Christ is what happens to you. And in fact, verse 4 has another way of stating it. When Christ, who is your life? See, Christ is your life. That's what defines uh, a believer. And... Uh, but what does that actually mean? What, what does that entail? And the, the, the rest of this passage tells us. Because if you look at verse 1, it says, uh, you have been raised with Christ. Uh, verse 3 says, you have died. Verse 4 says, you will appear with Christ in glory. And so when Paul, he's talking about Jesus here, and he's, saying, he's telling us the major turning events of Jesus' life. He died, he rose again. He's kind of come again in glory. And yet this passage says all of those things that are the major events of Jesus' life are now the major events of your life. In Christ, you have been raised. You have died. You, have, you will come again in glory. And so this is telling us that everything Jesus has achieved, his perfect life, his death to pay for sin, his resurrection to eternal life, even him being seated at the right hand of the Father, that's all now true of you. That's how God looks at you. He looks at you in Christ, which means he looks at you as if you have done all of those things. God now treats you as if you died on the cross to pay for sin. He treats you as if you have risen to new life because you have in Christ. And that's who you are. And that's a huge shift away from the way that we normally think about ourselves, you know, the way that we define our lives. 
This is a massive shift because we're shifting. Normally we think about the things we have done, the things we have achieved, as if they define us. But now we see when you come to Christ, no, no, it's what Christ has achieved, what he has done. That's what now defines your life. And can you, can you start to feel how liberating this is? Can you start to see how, if Christ is the one who defines my life, how liberating that is? Because now, rather than being outside of Christ, we're, we're, you know, outside of Christ, we're slaves to sin, we're, uh, we're spiritually dead, we're lost, we're hell-bound, we're under God's condemnation, there's nothing we can do to fix it. That's, that's us outside of Christ. But in Christ, now we are loved, accepted, guaranteed of eternal life, welcomed fully into the, the, even the right hand of the Father. We're seated with Christ. Do you feel how liberating this is? And see, this has so many implications for our lives. Uh, it transforms the way we think about our lives, especially the way we define ourselves. See, for example, um, for many people, uh, they've done something shameful in the past, something that, that even though it's in the past, it still brings shame, it still brings distress. And sometimes this, that shame, it can be so entrenched that it begins to actually shape the way they think of themselves. And so when someone doesn't treat them very well, they assume it must be because of that thing in the past that I did. Or if, if their day doesn't go well, they start to assume it must have been because of that shameful thing in the past. But see, what happens when your life is hidden with Christ in God? God now treats you not according to your mistakes, not according to that shameful thing, but he treats you according to Christ's record. Do you feel how liberating that is? Or perhaps some of you, uh, the, the way you think of your life, you think that your sins define you. And so, for example, if you have a, a real struggle with anger, you might have got to the point where you think to yourself, that's just who I am. I'm an angry person. Or if, you, know, you might say that with bitterness. I'm a bitter person. Or if you have a, an addiction with a, a particular substance, that's just who I am. And then you can see, is it no wonder that you can't get out of that? Become so entrenched. But look, if you're in Christ, his life defines you, not your sin. And so that means things like anger, bitterness, addiction. Any sin, it, it no longer is at home in your life. It no longer belongs. It doesn't fit with who you are in Christ. And when you embrace that, that's actually the first step to being free. The first step to putting those things to death. Well, here's another one. For some people, they let the, their afflictions define their life. Uh, so uh, things like a disability, an illness, uh, divorce, uh, these sort of afflictions. And someone who, who has that can, can look at their affliction and say, do you know my life is now deprived of joy forever? They start to define themselves as a sufferer. But look what happens. If your life is in Christ, suffering isn't the end. Okay, you're not left with this affliction forever because if you are in Christ, you have been raised with him. That means you have the guarantee of resurrection, physical resurrection. Whatever that affliction is, whatever that, that disability, that illness, one day that will be overshadowed by the joy of eternity in Christ's presence. And already the joy of that comes into your life now. Or perhaps, uh, here's one more. Maybe you let ach your achievements define your life. And that has an initial appeal, doesn't it? Because it feels like you've got something to show, something to say, this is what I have done. And yet if you let the achievement define your life, it actually ends up being exhausting. And the longer you're at it, the more you realise that everything we do, everything we try to achieve, it really all just comes to nothing in the end and a generation or two later, it'll all be forgotten. And it feels very empty. But if your life is in, hidden in Christ, then his achievements are yours, and they will never be forgotten. 
And in, in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, all your labour in the Lord is not in vain. Everything you do in, in, in union with Christ, it lasts. Everything you do as part of the kingdom, it endures. And so that's, that's the wonder of, of your life hidden in Christ. It means this is what defines you. Christ, his life. His death, His resurrection, His coming in glory. And so if we go back to that group, remember, here's the group, 30 people, it's finally got around to your turn. What are you going to say? Well, this is what I would say. I would say, hi, I'm Jared. Uh, The thing that defines my life is Jesus Christ. There you go. So that's the first thing. That's uh, our lives hidden with Christ. The next thing we see in this passage, though, is how we can experience that. Because... It's a reality that's true of us when we're a believer. And yet sometimes that reality, it doesn't really come home to how we live. You know, we still look to all these other things as if those other things define us. And so this passage is telling us how to bridge the gap between who we are and our experience of that. And it all comes down to the way that we think. So if you look at verse 1, it says, If you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things that are on earth. See, set your mind on things above. What are the things above that we're to be thinking about? The things above, is that just heaven, you know, angels, uh, choirs singing God's praises? Um, well, that's kind of part of it. That is um, something that is above. Uh, but what, what is the focus of the things above? You know, what, what is the focus of heaven? What is the focus of eternity? Where is all everyone's attention directed? Uh, and it actually tells us there in verse 2. It's where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. See, the focus of the things above is Christ himself. It's all about what he has done, what he, what he will do when he comes again. All that he is. And so this is saying that if our lives are hidden in Christ, then we need to get into the habit of thinking about him and all that he has achieved and thinking about our lives in him. That has to become now the daily habit that we think about. And if you look at verse 2, you can see there's a negative side to this as well because we're to think about things above not the things that are on earth. And what we see there is that we're all very skilled in setting our minds on things. It's part of being a human. (laughs) We do it all the time. We set our minds on things, the things we want, the things we try to do. And yet what we see in this passage is that we're very skilled at setting our mind on things that are on earth. We live our lives as if here and now is all there is as if there is no eternity, as if, as if here and now is all that we've got. And so we tend to, to make our daily decisions based on that mentality. And this verse is saying, no, no, we need to correct that. We need to turn from just focusing on the things that are on earth to now the things above. That's to be the new mentality. And as you can see, this is a new mindset that we need to practice. See, setting our minds on things above, it's, it's to be ongoing. It's, it's, it's in the present tense, which means it's something we need to do all of the time, something that we purposely need to do. We need to think this out. We need to actually ask ourselves tough questions like, where in my life am I just focusing on the here and now? Where have I forgotten eternity? Uh, how does eternity shape the way that I spend um, my time and my money? Uh, How does eternity shape the way that I save my money? Uh, The people I invest in. You know, we're coming up to Christmas time and we're going to see um, family members, some of whom don't know the Lord. What is the things above? How does thinking about the things above, how will that transform the kind of conversations we'll be trying to have? Uh, what does our prayer life show about where our mind is set? What, what do we pray for? What do you pray for? Is it just the things of this earth? Or are you thinking about the things above? 
things of ultimate purpose. Uh, how does the things above change the way you are responding to this la the latest setback in your life? Do you see how this affects everything? Who I am in Christ. That's now to shape everything that you think about. Even your daily routine. And uh, that's, that's why it's so good to look for ways that will assist you in doing this. What, what are some things that you can do in your life that will help you to set your mind on things above rather than the things of the earth. And uh, you've probably heard it a thousand times from, from this spot, daily reading your Bible, talking to God in prayer. It's so important. It's not just a, a rule to keep, but it's actually a useful, helpful way that we can either start the day or end the day. I know everyone finds that it works better with either one. But of getting into God's word and having his word shape our thoughts, thinking about the things above. That's so important. Talking to God in prayer, so important for this. Uh, you can do other things like reading a good book. That can be helpful to reshape your mind. Listening to good songs that exalt Jesus. Uh, attending a small group that gets into God's word, a Bible study group. Even coming to church. Why do you come to church? There's lots of reasons to come to church, but here's another one. To help you set your mind on things above. To recalibrate your thinking. So you're thinking about Christ and all that you have in Him. See, it's about looking for ways. I want to bridge the gap between who I am in Christ and my actual daily experience of it so that my life is reshaped uh, in accordance with that reality that my life is hidden with Christ. So that's, that's the second point. So our lives are hidden with Christ. We experience that by setting our mind on things above. And the third thing we see in this passage is where all of this is taking us. Where are we going uh, with, the things of, uh, with being in Christ? And let's look at verses 3 and 4 again. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God, when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. So in these two verses, notice how Paul contrasts the present experience of, of our life hidden with Christ with a future experience. The present experience of, of having Jesus is that your life is hidden in him. So hidden implies that it's not that obvious. You know, if you hide something valuable away, like in a safe, you can't see it. It's, it's not obvious to the eye. Uh, and that's, it's kind of like that with our union with Christ. It's a spiritual union. You can't really see just by looking at a person whether uh, you're united to Christ or not. Uh, for now, there's a hiddenness to it. But when Christ comes again, everything that's hidden will then be revealed. So your life you will be transformed to be like Jesus. Glorified is the, the word we, we use for that. Uh, verse 4 says, you will appear with Christ in glory. And so until that day, what's going to happen? Your life is hidden. Okay, the changes are going to be more internal. Uh, you'll see the fruit of it coming out, but it's an inner change. Uh, and it's this hiddenness, this, this hiddenness, it shows us that we don't have everything yet. Okay, all that, all that Christ has done, all that he will give us, we don't have it all yet. It's still to come. And so for now, there still will be a, a you know, you've got to fight against sin. You've got to endure trials. And sometimes people can come to Christ out of desperation, wanting their lives fixed, and they realize, what, I've still got to fight against sin? What, I've still got to endure trials? That's no good. I don't want to be free from these things. And the answer to that is, you will be eventually. When Christ comes again, everything that's broken and fallen and everything that weakens and distorts us and is faulty, all of that will be gone one day, but only when Jesus comes again. Until then, we still need to endure trials. We still need to put sin to death, as the rest of um, this chapter shows us. But if our lives are hidden with Christ... Well, we don't do that alone, do we? We don't fight sin in our own strength. We don't endure trials 
left to ourselves. We are with Christ. We are united to him. He lives in us. And so we have the ability uh, to, to do that. And in fact, we now have the hope that it will actually be finished one day. When Christ comes again, all that we long for, all of our longings will be fulfilled. In um, John's epistle, he says, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. See, it's all guaranteed if your life is in Christ. If it's hidden, that means it's secure. And that's why verse 4 can say, when Christ, who is your life, appears, you also will appear with him in glory. It's guaranteed. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reminder that when we come to Christ, that our lives are hidden in him. And we thank you, Father, for the, the, how liberating this is to know that you treat us not according to what our sins deserve. You treat us not according to failures or mistakes or any fault, but you treat us like you treat your own son. We thank you, Father, that we are loved, that we are accepted, and that we know that we are assured of eternal life in Christ, that nothing can separate us from his hand. And Father, we pray that that would give us a new way of thinking, that we would see every day as an opportunity to set our mind on things above and to live in light of, of Christ and eternity. Uh, we pray, Father, that you would help us to turn away from everything that, that isn't in line with that and that we would walk in Christ, that we would uh, grow in him. And we ask this in his name. Amen.